My name is Dr. Al Janovitz, and the doctor is an academic degree, not a medical degree. All right. And uh, tell us about your educational background, sir. I have a bachelor's degree in speech, hearing, and language science from the uh, Kent State University in Ohio, and a master's and a PhD in acoustics from the University of Connecticut in 1973. I'm sorry, did you say linguistics? Uh, no, in acoustics. Acoustics in this room, not that. <clears throat> All right. Go ahead, sir. Um, I received my PhD in 1973 from the University of Connecticut. Have you? Uh, ever given any um, forensic presentation, sir? Yes, I routinely uh, present at a number of societies having to do with speech, hearing, and language sciences, uh, probably on the order of about 8 to 10, 12 presentations a year. And how long has that been going on? Uh, probably the last 25 to 30 years. Right. Uh, and are these presentations national? Most all of them are national and international. Uh, have you testified uh, in state and federal courts throughout the United States concerning audio evidence? Yes, I have many times. And would you consider yourself to be an audiologist? Sorry, could you repeat that? Yes, are you an audiologist? Yes, in a clinical domain, I am an audiologist to treat people with hearing loss. Uh, have you testified uh, concerning autistic evidence? Yes. Both civil and criminal? Yes, both of them. And as a matter of fact, you have been, uh, you have worked with uh, the Houston Police Department, have you not? Many, many times. And in what capacity? Uh, many times uh, I have uh, helped the police department in terms of its surveillance issues. Uh, I've worked with uh, a number of uh, police officers in the homicide division, especially having to do with investigating cases where there's acoustic evidence. Have you worked with the Harris County District Attorney's Office? Numerous times. And in what capacity? Uh, I testified a great number of times in cases in, which involved um, Rusty Harden, uh, Chuck Rosenthal, and a number of assistant district attorneys, usually always with uh, acoustic evidence and speech language or hearing science. Have you ever been uh, Daubert challenged in federal court for your authenticity procedures? In the area of voice identification, I have an auth authenticity as well. And uh, what was the outcome of that issue? Case. Um, in a number, uh, I've testified hundreds of times having to do with acoustic issues in forensic sciences. Um, there was a time 20 years ago or more when uh, um, issues in voice identification and speaker identification was very controversial and uh, I represented the academic community on those aspects. And uh, there were times, maybe once, when the judge refused to allow any expert testimony, invoice identification, and um, there was one trial uh, that I felt I was not allowed to testify in uh, because of that same issue. Uh, and in the areas of expertise, uh, have you authored peer-reviewed publications? Could you repeat the last part of what you sure. said? Sure. Have you authored peer-reviewed publications? Yes, many, many times. I continue to do that still to this day. All right. What were you, uh, pardon me, do you have a partner? Yes. Um, his name is uh, Mr. Herbert Joe. He's a lawyer as well. And. Uh, your firm is Yanovich and Joe, correct? That's correct. Where is that located? In Dallas, Texas. All right. Um, and what were you asked to do in this case? In this case, I was asked to review uh, a great voluminous amount of 
of audio information, some of it video uh, recording as well. I was asked to look at text messages. I was given the whole uh, lot of uh, the um, evidentiary material that was recorded material. I was asked to uh, specifically uh, assimilate that material. I was asked to collate it. Uh, there were um, a great number of times through the uh, hours and hours of conversations where um, Mr. Jacob made commentary about what his intention was with Megan. And I was asked to take those conversations and to organize them, not to linguistically interpret them, uh, but instead to put them in a manner that would allow um, perhaps a jury to understand the structure of what was said during the time uh, that those indications by Mr. Jacob were made. Right. Uh, Your Honor, I would tender uh, Mr. Yanovich is an expert uh, audiologist and would ask that he be permitted to testify in front of this jury. Yes. Thank you, Judge. Uh, so, Doctor, your testimony is, is it, you're, and I'm sorry, it's a doctor, correct? Could you repeat that? Your, your doctor, your PhD? Do, your doctor. Your yes. Doctor. Yeah, okay. Um, you're, so your, your testimony here today would be essentially telling the jury about statements that have been recorded in another, in, in a fashion that they're organized by you in a different way. That's only part of it. Okay. Uh, and, I, and I see that. I, th I see that you, um, you have a report as well, correct? Yes. When you said that's only part of it, what exactly would be your testimony regarding your reorganization of, of the recorded statements? Well, there's, there were two, two comments made by the, what was, I would like the opportunity to tell you what the other part was, but to answer your question specifically, um, by organizing the material, I simply was able to extract the material from the voluminous amount of recordings to put them into topical areas, not excluding anything. As Mr. Parnum had said, find anything and everything that existed in those conversations where Mr. Jacob is, is commenting on what should happen to Megan. Don't just state the positive and good things for him, state everything. So I did that. I also noticed that a number of conversations where important material existed uh, was masked by uh, environmental noise or competing sounds that would make it difficult for anyone to understand truly the words. So I was able to do a digital enhancement procedure uh, acceptable to the scientific community that would uh, reduce the background noise and let you more easily understand the words. And I did that with care so as not to um, make it um, a product where any of the words were modified or changed or can be mis misperceived. Did you make a copy of that enhanced version? Your Honor, this goes beyond the boundaries of the Dalper proceeding. It goes to the qualifications of the individual to testify as an expert. This is well beyond what those uh, parameters are as far as Dalper is concerned. I think you're going into the details of what you did, so I kind of sus I, I will sustain the objection. Let's keep it specifically to what Donald entails is to so if, if I'm a, if I'm understanding correctly you enhance the audio on the recordings you received where it was needed yes and you search for certain words or phrases uh, that you could find regarding what the defendant said about what he wanted done with Megan correct I did not imply any intent to what he uh, what what he was suggesting to be done with Megan, only what his words clearly indicated. Okay, when you say what words clearly indicated, you're, you're drawing a conclusion, aren't you? Yes. This is well beyond Dalbert. We've well, established his qualifications and 
to testify. This is a material that the jury... Judge, if I may... And if, 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 if it's, it's discovery as far as the state's concerned, it's, ask, it's cross-examination which should be done in front of the jury. Well, this is simple, simply discovery for the state. Well, I, do, I, I, do, I appreciate that, but I disagree. I think the state has a right to understand what it is that he's going to offer the jury. As to whether or not what it is he's offering the jury is something that is needed for the jury to make a decision in this case. So that's overruled. Continue. So what I'm understanding is you have taken out certain phrases or statements and then you have reorganized them in some way for a presentation. I reorganized it in a, in a chronological form following the time train that it existed. Um, but I was able to just extract the statements and uh, collate them together. When you, let me stop you. When you say you, you use words, excuse me. You are, this we've established, I take it, that he is an expert and will be permitted to testify in front of the jury. I'm not sure what he's an expert in. Audiology, Your Honor. That's which what he testified is, to. Which I heard it once. What is it again? Well, audiology is the clinical application of acoustics, but I am most I am an acoustics expert and deal with uh, evidentiary material that's been recorded on a routinely basis in courts. Can I continue, Jeff? Your Honor, what I would like to add is a, 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 a ruling by the court as to whether or not he meets the qualifications of Dalbert. And then the state can continue to do whatever it wants. Well, we're not to do. there yet. On this point. All right. You know, only it's only one step that he's an expert. There's several other steps besides saying, okay, this person's an expert. There are more steps than just that involved. I'm trying to understand what he's an expert in. Well, now he's saying he's an expert in acoustics. I'm not. Doctor, would you explain for the court what an expert in acoustics is? Yes. Well, there are <clears throat> a number of aspects of uh, being an acoustic expert. One of them um, considers, for example, transcription. Another considers enhancement when the material is very difficult to understand and the environmental or background noise has to be reduced. Another aspect of forensic acoustics is voice identification. Another topic would be authenticity. And I've been uh, succeeded in a Daubert challenge in, in authenticity analysis and do that on a routine basis so in testimony. Understanding then that you're called upon to say there's a recording, can't really make out who's saying what or what it is they're saying, and your expertise says this is the person that's speaking and this is what they said when it's not otherwise audible to a jury? That is correct. And is that what you're here to testify about? Uh, I did that in a great number of the exemplars that I selected from the taped material. And that would be, that's why I asked the question to you earlier, Doctor. Did you make a copy of the enhanced version that you said you made in this case? I copied out selections uh, that were determined by me to be related to what Mr. Jacob uh, indicated he wanted to have happen to Megan. Okay, let's stop that. Are there, I didn't realize there were any critical areas of the audio portions of these tapes that there was any major differences as to what was said that was crucial to the case. Now, if that is a situation, then I would be inclined to allow the doctor to uh, testify as to what he believes was said and by whom, but unless we have that dispute, I don't see the necessity of what this person is going to add to anything. Mr. Porter? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, previously, we had a dispute concerning transcripts, and uh, the state, we approached the bench. Well, I know that. And, and, and that, that, that was a dispute, and I think that that... So, is he going to testify to that? Well, I think he's going to testify as to uh, information that uh, I tendered to him uh, concerning the identity of individuals, uh, what one person said, uh, and the context in which they said it. And I think that's important for the jury to hear. 
I'm not sure I understand the context of what you're saying. That sounds to me like an interpretation of what they meant, and I don't believe that's what he's saying he does. Yeah, I have them again. Well, I'll ask you, is that what you do? Did you listen to what somebody says and you're able to testify as to what their intent was? No, I'm not doing that. I'm not presenting material on what the intent was. But there are a great uh, difference. There is a, uh, a, a large amount of um, not necessarily ambiguity, but there is a large amount of differentiation between um, what Mr. Jacob has said, and to put that in organization without interpretation, without modifying, is a, gr a great asset to the jury, I believe. Uh, I'm going to show you the conclusions that are listed in your report, Doctor. Um, and let's start with number one. These are your conclusions, correct? Yes. Leon Jacob was always under the impression that he and the undercover officer had made arrangements for the undercover officer to relocate Megan to Pittsburgh. That was one of your conclusions. That's correct. Are you a psychologist, sir? No. Okay. That, that is a conclusion that you drew as an expert in the field of audio. That's a conclusion that I drew from the conversation that Mr. Jacob had with the undercover officer. Yes. Let me stop. If this is where we're heading with this witness, who is a, an expert in acoustics, this is well beyond to me what an expert is, and I've never encountered one. But I would think, based on what this witness has told me, this is well beyond what his expertise is in. He's drawing conclusions now of what someone intended, what they implied, what was and I'm, you know that's the that invades the providence of the jury, and I would be uh, not inclined to allow anyone to get on the stand and say, well, in my opinion, this is what he meant. He's not a psychiatrist. He's not a psychologist. He's an acoustics expert. So if that's what we got, then I'm not inclined to allow the testimony. If he wants to testify about. Here's some garble, we can't understand what it is, and he's amplified it, and here's what was actually said, then I'm fine with it. But when you start saying, well, I put it all together, and here's what I think he meant, nope, that's not going to happen. Could we ask Judge Levy to provide a copy of this so-called enhanced audio that he's going to draw his conclusions from? Well, if he's actually going to testify now, given the fact that I'm now limiting him to testify solely to deciphering garbled language that cannot otherwise be understood by any of the parties or the jury. And, and that's my issue, Judge, is that he's talking about an enhanced version he made from which he's going to make those statements. That has not been made available to me. From what I understand, that is not available to me. I'm not able to have my own expert review his enhanced version. He's, he's basically telling the jury what his belief is that is said on the audio. And I think best evidence rule dictates that the jury decides whether they can truly make out what's being said or not. There's no, there, I can't review his materials. Thank you so much. I'm not stupid. I agree. Uh, if this has not already been provided to the state so that they've had an opportunity to have their own expert agree or disagree with his interpretation of what was said, I will not allow his testimony, period. What else do we have? Or uh, final report uh, from Dr. Yanovich uh, earlier today to the prosecutor. We just, it, it's been a very short period of time since we've seen the uh, final report from Dr. Yanovich. Well, I would suggest then, given the fact that I'm not going to allow this person to testify, and you want to enter that as an exhibit uh, for the appellate record, you're more than happy to do so, but I, I'm not inclined to allow this, this witness to testify sure about his opinions as to what he meant, nor the interpretation he understands of what was said since the state has not been previously provided with the, uh, his opinions as to what any kind of blood or the inaudible uh, sound bites on the tape. If I may, Your Honor, he will not be getting into his own conclusions of what he That's believes. Exactly. I mean, how can you say that? I've just seen what he's saying, and he is doing that. He, we will not allow him to go into that, Your Honor, but he has taken a great chunk of the material that's been played for this court, and Your Honor, yourself okay. well, said. Well, then you're under an obligation, I believe, uh, since you have to provide the estate with uh, your experts' names and stuff like that, which you've done, I assume. Just, 
but you know, also, uh, if he's going to get up there and say, here's what the inaudible testimony says, the state certainly had a right, or has a right, to see that in advance so that they, in turn, can have their own experts agree or disagree. They've not had that opportunity. Uh, it would be unfair prejudice to the state, and I won't allow it. And that's it, period. Let's move on. Thank you for your, your time, Dr. Your speaker. Told that we would not have a copy of the state transcript, and we may have made that request early on. That, that's not true. That's well, not it true. is true. No, if he had asked me for a copy of my transcript, I most certainly would have provided it. I was never asked for a copy of my transcript. Well, this is a totally different matter, uh, Mr. Cohen. You know, personally, to make everything's job easier, both of you should have got together and said, let's get one transcript and agree on it. That wasn't done. And so we wasted all this time. That should have been done. Now, you're saying the state didn't give you a copy of theirs. I don't know if you gave them a copy of yours. But that has nothing to do with this person testifying as to what his interpretation of the transcript is if the state has not previously had an opportunity to, to review that in advance. Well, no, what am I going to do? Then the state's going to stand up, Your Honor, we need time to see if we agree or not agree, and let's continue for two weeks until we get that done. It's not going to happen. Let's move on, please. May we approach briefly? And we have to approach Paul. All right.